There, ah, there we go. Okay, everybody's here. So this is uh, Martinez versus Lobster Haven. Mr. Cafe, did I say your name correctly? It's actually Kathy. Okay, Kath. Okay. All right, sir. You're up. And I guess the first thing you want to tell us is whether or not you're going to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Yes, Your Honor. Five minutes, please. May it please the court? Yes. My name is Brandon Cathy. Uh, I represent Angel and Maria Martinez. And we're here today requesting that this court reverse the granting of a post-trial directed verdict for the defendant because ample evidence supported the jury's verdict in this case that the defendant's defective seafood caused Mr. Martinez's uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS as we've been calling it. And uh, the, our argument boils down really to three things today. We, we say that the trial court committed uh, three errors, each of which independently require reversal. Uh, the first one is that the, the trial court squarely violated this court's binding precedent in Zach, Benson, and Granix when it disregarded the testimony of the plaintiff's epidemiologist as an impermissible inference stacking by an expert. Um, not only are experts explicitly permitted uh, by the law of the state to stack inferences, but Mr. Freeman actually did not stack any inferences uh, in rendering his opinion. Uh, and that error alone requires reversal. Uh, the, the second one is that the, the court really squarely violated the law when it disregarded evidence from Mr. Martinez's treating physicians that the seafood poisoning was what caused his GBS. Uh, Mr. Martinez's treating physician, Dr. DiDio, testified that the December 21st, 2013 seafood poisoning uh, was what caused the GBS. And Dr. Um, uh, Mr. Martinez's two treating physicians uh, who initially diagnosed his GBS at Tampa General Hospital in their medical records uh, also indicated that GBS was, quote, likely related to gastroenteritis at Christmas time. But doesn't the evidence also show that there's not a single reported case ever in medical history that connects GBS to um, oysters? That is true, Your Honor. Um, the, the Supreme Court in 2003 in the Castillo case said that a, a plaintiff clearly has no uh, is not required to present epidemiological studies in order to meet their burden of proof. And in this case, it's true, we did not present any epidemiological studies, there were none. But uh, Dr. Freeman, the plaintiff's expert epidemiologist, testified to that and testified that that was not surprising because when you're dealing with shell food poisoning and this bacteria that he believed was the, the most common and most likely to have caused the, the GBS, that uh, there's only 300 confirmed cases per year. And so it wasn't surprising uh, that, that, that there was no reported decision. He testified, of course, that this can be caused by an ever-growing number of pathogens. And um, it, it was simply unnecessary to his opinion to know which one it was. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Freeman uh, went on to testify that whenever we, let me, let me get his, he, he testified that when a person experiences gastroenteritis, from a foodborne illness less than three weeks before the onset of GBS symptoms, the preceding gastroenteritis will be deemed the cause unless there was some other intervening cause. And accordingly, he testified- Let's, let's that, talk about the intervening cause for a minute. There was some evidence in the record about a sheep slaughter that took place a couple days after the lobster haven dinner. Is that right? There, there was evidence to that effect. And the, the, our position, of course, is the jury was free to reject that based on the conflicting evidence. But we know that that the the uh, pathogen that's in the sheep, is it called jejuni or jejune or however you pronounce it? Uh, Campylobacter, right? Campylobacter jejuni. Uh, there was no evidence to support that there was Campylobacter jejuni in the in the sheep or the lamb is what it was, but in the lamb that uh, was allegedly slaughtered by Mr. Martinez. But maybe even a sort of an easier point here is that uh, Mrs. Martinez testified that Mr. Martinez did not slaughter the lamb, but he was mistaken in his memory about that. And so the jury was entitled to, to believe that testimony and disregard that there was any, any lamb slaughter uh, contamination whatsoever. I um, guess the, what, where I was getting to is that the, the jejuni is a known cause of the GBS. Is that right? There is an association? One, yes, one of the known associations. Whereas the vibrio that is the... the uh, problem that's associated with oysters has never been deemed to have anything to do with GBS, correct? That's true. 
there's not there's not been a published study on it until I, I should mention you know so, since the, the time of this trial Dr. Freeman has published a study on this and so the next plaintiff who comes along won't have the same issue with there having never been a published case. So at, at, at deposition, the plaintiff indicated that he participated in the sheep slaughter and he was barehanded and had his hands all in it and so forth. And then at trial, he said he didn't have anything to do with it other than supervisory, correct? Correct, Your Honor. He, he testified that, that you know, after he had given that testimony, his wife, who's, who's always consistently testified this way in her deposition of 2017 and the 2018 trial, that he was wrong about that. You know, he wasn't in a condition to be doing that. There was actually friends of theirs who had done. The oh, then, so I guess I misunderstood. I thought she had also testified in deposition that um, initially he had his hands all over it, and then she also recanted her testimony. Am I mistaken about that? You know, she, she testified that there was a, slant, a lamb slaughter and that Mr. Martinez was present, but she testified that it was not he who did the, did the actual lamb slaughter. So she was consistent in that, both at deposition and at trial? For the most part. I mean, Mr. Mrs. Because Martinez, I didn't read it that way. I read it that she also testified that he had his hands all over the lamb at deposition, and then at trial, she said, no, I've thought about it, and it was other people, not him. So again, am I confused about that? I think so, Your Honor. If, if, if you look, look to the trial testimony, she was, she was impeached about that, and she acknowledged that there was a, a lamb slaughter and that he was present there and that she had said that before, but she testified that it I, was. I thought, I thought it was based on some later photos that she reviewed that refreshed her memory or something like that. She did say that she, she in response to some juror questions, uh, that she had, she had come across some photos in her phone that kind of reminded her of that, um, but you know, th those photos Does any of this really matter, though? Is this relevant? Because your point is the jury had enough evidence to make this call. Correct. And whether you like the call they made or not, they made the call based on the evidence. Isn't that your point? That precisely, Your Honor. Okay. The, 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 the entire lamb story, the, the, the story was more than just a lamb slaughter. For the defendant's theory to, to, to carry water, they had to also, they had, had to also demonstrate that Mr. Mr. Martinez was likely to have eaten lamb feces contaminated with Campylobacter jejuni, and there was just simply no evidence of that. Um, and the jury was free to reject that story entirely. Uh, but the, the defendant got to make that case. They put an expert on to try to support that case. They argued it to the jury, and the jury rejected it. Um, and so the, the, the issue um, as to Dr. Dr. Freeman's testimony, even if this court were to recede from Zach, Benson, and Granix and say that um, we're going to now apply the stacking inference rule to expert witnesses. Dr. Freeman didn't stack any inferences. His, his, uh, his opinion was stacked upon a stipulated fact. So you know, e even where the rule requires uh, an expert to base it on a reasonable, uh, a reasonable inference, certainly a stipulated fact is a reasonable inference. And Dr. Uh, and the fact being that, that Lobster Haven between the two trials conceded that they put some bad seafood into the system. Is that right? Correct, that, that, it was, that it was bad, their bad seafood that caused the GI. Correct, Your Honor. And that was, between, that was after the first trial, but before the second trial. Yes, and we, that, that, we believe that is what caused the, the, the court, the trial court below confusion, that it kind of mixed up the issues from the first case where there was, with Ms., where Dr. Freeman was having to make additional inferences because that wasn't, that wasn't a, a stipulated fact. Because one, one of the inferences that's in the court order goes to that issue, but it, it really, it became a fact more than an inference. At the time of the first trial, it was an inference that the seafood caused the GI. At the time of the second trial, that was an admitted fact. Correct, Your Honor. And so the, Dr. Dr. Freeman's opinion then was a single inference, which was that that, that seafood poisoning event, because of the fact that it's it preceded by two to three weeks of GBS, which you know, the, even the defendant's doctor conceded at this point, this is classic preceding you know, causation trigger for GBS is a GI infection. It's the most common one. And so if we know with 100% certainty there's a GI infection from defective seafood on December the 21st, and by January the 4th, he's got symptoms precisely two weeks later uh, of, of GBS, we know that's the cause without there being some other evidence of another cause. And there's simply- So cause when the dust settles, Dr. Freeman really concluded that it doesn't matter whether it's Vibrio or Jejuni or whatever, the fact that is of consequence to him is that it's within that two to three week period. There's a GI caused by seafood, which then down the road ends up with GBS. And that's enough for, in his mind, that's enough for him to render an opinion that the two are related. Correct, Your Honor. Without that, that anything was, else. 
Correct, Your Honor. That, that was, you know, importantly, that was also the, the testimony of Dr. Didia, who was a, a neurologist, and said that, you know, ne neurologists are not concerned with, you know, at the cellular level, what precisely the, the pathogen was, that, that it's, it's understood, you know, from the, the 140 GBS patients that he treats, that the most common situation is a, is a GI infection um, two to three weeks beforehand. And so if, if we know for sure there was a GI infection two to three weeks earlier and it was caused by defective seafood, you know, the jury's got kind of an easy, an easy job to do. Uh, it was the defective seafood. And so the, the trial court, of course, then, then erred in not only disregarding Dr. Freeman's testimony on that, but disregarding Dr. DiDio as well as the uh, doctors at TGH um, who, who gave the same opinion. Um, the, the, the court, the, the foundation essentially and the, de the defense's entire argument really is built upon this concept that experts can't stack inferences. And as, as we've covered, he didn't stack any inferences anyways. But th this court uh, in, in 1975 uh, reversed a JNOV where the trial court held precisely what the trial court held here. Um, and Zach, the trial court had said that, you know, if the jury is not permitted to pyramid inference upon inference, unless the initial or preceding inference is established to the exclusion of all other reasonable inferences, then certainly the plaintiff cannot avoid application of this rule by having an expert witness uh, indulge in a violation of this rule. And then reversing, this court said and explained that the rule against stacking inferences does not apply to expert witnesses and rule that uh, expert witness opinions, quote, become direct evidence and not an inference from circumstantial evidence. So when considering the expert's opinion as direct evidence, the plaintiff in that case made a prima facie case on causation, which was properly submitted to the jury. And we have exactly that same situation here. Um, since 1975, this court has reaffirmed that in uh, Benson versus State in 1998, saying to the extent expert testimony in this case involved basing inference upon inference, that was not impermissible and was a matter for the jury to consider. And then m most recently in 2014 in Granix versus Cheria, this court was, was faced with a, 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 an appeal where a defendant physician was arguing summary judgment should be affirmed because expert testimony that would be necessary to prove the case would be inadmissible as a violation of the rule against stacking inferences. And the court said, we reject this argument because the rule against the stacking of inferences does not apply to expert testimony that's based on reasonable inferences that can be drawn from the evidence. Dr. Dr. Freeman's testimony was based upon a, uh, the, the inference, if we're calling it that, upon which his testimony was based was a stipulated fact. Um, there's, there's been no appellate court in Florida that has ever applied the stacking inferences bar to expert witnesses. Um, you know, as this court said, and Zach, and as the, and quoting the first district, it's applied this rule the same way. Such a rule does not comport with logic, reason, or the practicalities of the judicial process. Um, the, the, the third ground for reversal is, is that the defendants in this case never uh, moved for directed verdict um, after the close of the evidence before the case was submitted to trial. And that that's a squarely a, a, a violation of this court's decision in TLOS Farms um, from just last year. Uh, this court said that a party cannot seek judgment in accordance with a previously made motion for directed verdict unless that party has actually asserted the grounds raised in the motion for directed verdict made at the conclusion of the evidence in the case. And kind of interestingly, I, I noted that you know our, our trial judge in this case allowed and considered the motion for directed verdict, he said, based upon his memory of things having occurred. And the, of course, the trial record demonstrated that no such motion was made. And well, there was a number of conversations about it and whether or not they amount to preservation or not is, I suppose, subject to debate, which is why we're here debating it. But the plaintiff made some commentary at the pretrial conference about evidence. I guess it, I think the wording was uh, the legal rulings would carry over to this trial. And then there was some discussion after the plaintiff's case and then again after the defense case and whether that gets you there or not i guess we'll hear from mr tinker on that but um the, I, I i agree with you that what the judge thought doesn't necessarily carry the day but it is interesting that he certainly was under the impression that they that it was that the dv was still fair game for him to consider and i don't it just it, it could have been a little more clear for all of us and it would have been uh Maybe we wouldn't be here on that issue. Yes, Your Honor. The you know and, and the, the the court in, in TLOS kind of addressed this issue. Uh, it said that you know with the advantage of the trial transcripts before us, 
we agree that the defendants did not challenge at trial the evidence establishing the defendants engaged in that case in unconscionable acts, you know, dot, dot, dot. Accordingly, the trial court erred in granting the defendant's motion. And the, the defendant's argument is that is, is not that they may ever made any motion for a directed verdict at this trial based upon the evidence presented at this trial. They, their, their argument is that they made a motion for a directed verdict in a 2017 trial, which as a matter of logic can't possibly have been based upon the evidence presented in a 2018 trial. So it just simply makes no sense to say that, uh, that that motion was made. And, and uh, more to the point there, the, what you referenced about the conversation, the pretrial conference. Mr. Kath, just so you know, you're at 15 minutes. And if you're going to reserve rebuttal time, you're going to, you're bleeding into it, but it's your time. You use it any way you want. I'll stop right there. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. All right. You have five minutes when we come back. Mr. Tinker. May it please the court. Good afternoon. Mark Tinker on behalf of Lobster Haven. I'd like to start with, I think, one of the most critical uh, things that was mentioned, I, I believe Judge Black, Black, you brought it up originally, uh, it has to do with the stipulations and whether there was an inference made about the seafood causing a GI infection. That is not the stipulation. And that was made very clear, actually, by Martinez's counsel in the trial court. They made that very clear when they were trying to get their expert, uh, Dr. Didio, to testify. The stipulation was that the seafood had a defect, is what, what it was termed at one point, and that what was read to the jury was that it caused food poisoning. That is not the same as a GI infection, and that was made very clear. Uh, how this came up was the plaintiff uh, called Dr. Didio. He, in his deposition testimony, said, I'm not qualified to say what caused this GI infection. I have no idea. That's not my job. I couldn't tell you. I have no opinion on that. At trial, he was asked, is it your opinion that his GBS was caused by a GI infection? And there was an objection to that saying, wait a minute, that's a new opinion. He said he was not qualified to do that. So there was a big conference that took place at the bench. And the distinction was made that he's saying a GI infection caused the Guillain-Barre. He's not saying anything at Oyster Haven or Lobster Haven caused the GI infection. He can't say that. He doesn't know that. He said they had food poisoning. Food poisoning is not the same. And I'm just going to read you a couple of quotes. These are from uh, Martinez's own counsel. He is not going to testify that he has an opinion about what caused the GI infection. There's a distinction between him saying that the oysters caused the GI infection and what caused the GBS. He's not saying that. And then the judge, uh, Judge Varbus said, a gastrointestinal infection is not the same thing as food poisoning. You don't have to have food poisoning to have a gastrointestinal infection, as you know. And then uh, Didio took the Wasn't the testimony, again. though, that a, that, a, that a gastrointestinal infection typically follows food poisoning? Or have I misunderstood that testimony? No, no, it does not. Uh, okay. that's, the, that's, the, that's one of the big keys. That's one okay. of the things that Freeman had to infer. Uh, they both, Mr. and Mrs. Martinez, both got sick. They both got food poisoning of some sort from Lobster Haven. Never established what it was. Did that turn into a GI infection in Mr. Martinez and not Mrs. Martinez? That was an inference that uh, Dr. Freeman made. That's something Dr. Didio said, I cannot tell you that. I'm not qualified. I have no okay. idea. I have no opinion. Mr. Tinker, a, a bigger concern to me than that issue is the issue about the um, uh, the directing verdict motion that was not made at the close of the plaintiff's case. And the suggestion that the one made in an earlier trial was somehow brought over to this trial. I, I you know, I, I, before I, you know, start wearing a robe, I used to go to court and try cases. So I can't understand in my mind how you can preserve a DV, DV motion in one trial and carry it over to another trial unless the evidence is absolutely identical. And I don't see that it was in this case, so I don't understand. You're gonna to have to help me with this. I've never seen this before in my life. I don't understand how this can happen. It just is a complete non sequitur to me. Absolutely, Your Honor. The issue is that the DB is based on the fact that Dr. Freeman is the only one that could connect the dots that I was just talking about. Does the, uh, the sickness from Lobster Haven turn into the GI infection. He's the only one that can connect those dots. And the DV was made on Dr. Freeman is impermissibly stacking inferences. Without him, their case fails. So it's a DV because they have no one to connect those dots. So at the first, well, it was actually made pre-trial at the, you know, there's a pre-trial motion hearing to strike him. 
Um, the, the argument was presented there at the first trial. It was made on the same grounds. And then we carried over to the second trial. And the thing is, at the end of Dr. Freeman's testimony in trial number two, it was the same objection was made. Well, you know, OK, Dr. Freeman just testified again. He's stacking inferences again. And I'm going to read you actually the quote. It was, if you bear with me for one second. The, the quote was that we renewed the motions to the prior motions to exclude Dr. Freeman's testimony, asked that it be stricken from the record based on his inference stacking. And the judge stopped him and said, same ruling as previously made in the previous trial and here. And how and long ago was that previous trial prior to this? It was a, a couple of years, Your Honor. But so it was the, the same. The, the trials were the a couple of years apart? The issue is the same. He's stacking. And, and this is. Well, this judge could remember the precision of that motion several years earlier. This judge was asked, would you like argument on it again, judge? And he said, no, I don't want any more argument. Same ruling as previous trial. Well, we also heard, way smarter than I am. I don't know how we, I could argue. We also <laughs> I would had never a, be able to remember that. We also had a change before. in the evidence from between one trial to, to the next. And in, insofar as the admission goes by Lobster Haven, that at, le at a minimum, it, that it was responsible for food poisoning. That was not present in the first trial. Correct, but it changes nothing with respect to Dr. Freeman's testimony. Maybe he, not with Dr. Freeman, but it does change with Dr. Didio's testimony, no. does it not? No, it does not, Your Honor, and that's the key. Didio could not, he admitted on the stand at the second trial, he said, I am offering no opinion on whether what that defect, that food poisoning from Lobster Haven, the stipulated fact, I have no opinion on whether that led to a GI infection. I can't tell you. He so did he, testify. He testified, and maybe, maybe, maybe we've been guilty of combining food poisoning with a GI infection. But Dr. Didio, as I recall, testified that the GI infection was a cause of the GBS, but he was not willing to say what caused the GI infection. Is that accurate? Correct. That is correct, Your Honor. And, and you're saying that the food poisoning, that, that, that the, the evidence got no further than food poisoning, that it did not amount to a GI infection? Correct. And that was the stipulation was food poisoning for both Mr. and Mrs. Martinez. They both became sick. We know that. Whether that turned in, whether the GI infection that Mr. Martinez got, and this is where these, these intervening causes start coming in because we have the lamb slaughter thing uh, that occurred. And, and to go to your question, uh, Judge Morris, uh, at the, her in her deposition, Mrs. Martinez did say originally he slaughtered the lamb. She changed her testimony yeah, also. Yeah. Uh, but the, the question is, with that, so now we have Dr. Freeman, and he's trying to connect these dots that no one else could connect. And he's saying, well, okay, I'm going to assume that it's only one constant illness that went across this whole thing. And in order to do that, he has to eliminate all these other possibilities. So if he's going to eliminate, okay, there was another illness that came in because there's evidence that Mr. Martinez got better, that he was back to normal and then got sick again. He said, well, you can't do that if it's coming from the lobster haven meal. That's not a, that's medically impossible. So I have to assume it's one sickness. So I have to disregard, I have to infer that he didn't get sick from the lamb slaughter issue, even though that's contains the bacteria, the jejuni, that is the most common cause of GBS. So he inferred that away saying that his reason for inferring that away is, well, he'd have to be pretty unlucky to get sick twice within the same week, as opposed to being the first person in the history of documented medicine to have something else happen to him. He's, he's that lucky, but he's not, he's, not unlucky enough to get sick twice. So we inferred that away. And then there was an argument made that, well, to Dr. Freeman, it doesn't matter what kind of bacteria he, he did get sick with. And that's not true either because Dr. Freeman said so. He said, I know it can't be jejuni because the incubation period isn't right. If he got jejuni from Lobster Haven, he wouldn't have been sick within two hours, two to three hours as he testified and his wife testified also. It takes a lot longer than that. He said, actually, the two to three hours is an outlier for even Vibrio. Vibrio usually takes about four. He said, we'll give him the, the two to three. So I'm going to assume it's Vibrio, Vibrio based on the incubation period. But it did matter to him. He had to eliminate that based on the, you know, the timing of what the testimony was as far as when he got sick. So all of these things, he's eliminating all of these other possibilities by just making inferences, despite the fact that there were other more reasonable possibilities. Is it more reasonable that he would get the jejuni from a lamb and 
end up having the incubation period match precisely with Christmas Eve, have that be the bacteria that most likely causes GBS, but you ended up with, I mean, all of those things lined up. Well, he dismissed all of those along the way by stacking inferences upon inferences and just eliminating all the possibilities as he went. And that's where uh, the judge looked at it and said, this is, it's not about, uh, you know, do we disagree with his testimony or find it unlikely? It's incompetent testimony to do that. You cannot just blindly eliminate and stack at every step of the way and, and arrive at the conclusion that he did. Mr. Tinker, I'm not gonna let you off the hook on the DV as easily okay. as you've been let off so far. I wanna go back and plow that ground a little harder. Okay, yes, so what I wanna make clear is, you know, our case law, it, we have, have a tremendous amount of case law where we analyze the adequacy of a motion for a directed verdict, not whether one was made, because the law is clear. You don't make one, you can't make one post-trial, you're done, it's over. So the only argument that you have is that somehow the, the one that was made two years earlier in a previous trial was somehow brought over into this trial, even though it was not specifically put on the record about what that actual motion was. So later at the end of the trial, this post-trial motion for directed verdict has been made, drawing on the strength of this previous motion that was made two years earlier and the specifics of which are nowhere on the record in this trial. Is that right? Am I the right specifics. about it? Be, the specifics of the motion are nowhere on the record of the trial that we're here talking about. Correct. They just said, we're bringing it over from, from back before without any detail. So then this post-trial motion has made with more specific detail, right? Correct. Okay, and then the judge grants it based on this incredible memory he has of a motion that was made two years before in a trial. While all this, and I mean, you know, I, I was a circuit judge too. I know that tranche of cases that just comes at you forever. I mean, you have this massive amount of information that you're supposed to assimilate every day constantly. So the fact that you could remember something that happened in a trial two years ago is beyond my comprehension. I, I, I think that that is a superhuman that could do that because I could never do that, okay? So I'm having a hard time. In our record, there is no details of what the DV motion was that was made at the end of the plaintiff's case. We have no idea what those details are, right? And in, in our record, the, the details is that it's based on the stacking of inferences of Freeman and without Freeman, the case fails. But nobody says that, do they? It's, it is the motion for DV. Uh, well, well, the motion that was ultimately made at the end of the trial says that, but the motion that was made at the end of the plaintiff's case doesn't say that, right? At the end of plaintiff's case, it just says renew, correct? Seriously, how do we get there from here? I mean, well, there's no get... case in Florida that's going to support this. This is like hanging way out on a tiny branch all by itself, waiting for somebody to saw it off. I mean, I'll there's do, no way. <laughs> I'll do two things. And this is, I'll, I'll give you my, my safety valve first. The safety valve is that uh, we know, uh, even if there's been no directed verdict motion, that a manifest weight of the evidence motion is proper if brought in and as a motion for new trial for the first time. That was made here. The motion for new, at the end of the post-trial motion said this verdict is against the manifest weight of the evidence because Dr. Freeman is improper. He, his, without his testimony, there's nothing to support their case. So that motion alone preserves the issue to bring it before you today. That is the case with, with Dr. Freeman improper, as we know that Judge Barbas decided, he said, I made a mistake by letting him in. I shouldn't have. And now that I've looked back at everything, he, he decided that was improper testimony. Without that, the manifest weight of the evidence does not support their case. So that motion, basically, like I said, it's a safety valve issue. But the second thing, I mean, I, mean, I, I understand the, you know, if you look at all of the different nuances and what the conversations that people are having, it almost looks like they're having, you know, an inside joke kind of conversation where we don't know exactly what they're talking about. They refer to things. Are we going to bring over these same issues? Yes, we are. And we don't know what they're talking about on the record, unfortunately. But the issue is with preservation, this court, uh, as you know, you're a court of error, your court of judicial error. You're not here to you know, look at issues in a vacuum. You're here to look at, did the judge have an ability to make a ruling? understand the issues and make a ruling and then did the judge get it right and judge barbus looked at this and he said i understood what was happening i knew you meant to carry this over i know we're talking about the stacking of inferences with freeman he after these post-trial motions were heard and then reheard again 
he took his time and, you know, months passed and he hand wrote, or not hand wrote, he wrote his own seven page order. He did not ask for, you know, people to submit proposals and take language from them. Like you see with a lot of orders, he wrote his own. He remembered this. He looked at it. He studied it. We all gave him transcripts of both trials and every, all the depositions and everything. And he looked at it and decided I made a mistake. I shouldn't have let Freeman in. He Let me knew jump the in issue. On, he made a ruling, one. and that, that should be sufficient. I want to make one more point about the directed verdict motion because Judge Barbas commented on Dr. Didio's testimony in his order that that, that that testimony was never challenged by a motion for directed verdict. It was never addressed. It, and it didn't need to be, Your Honor, because he said, he testified, I'm not offering that opinion. I can't. I'm not competent to do it. So Dr. Didio said, I, I can't make that link. I, I, he, I would defer. So there was no reason to move for a DV on him when he didn't offer the opinion. I'll have to go back and look at his exact, I know he did offer the opinion that the, the uh, GI could be a cause of the GBS. I, I, I need to look at that nuance a little more about And the, I, I can tell you, Your Honor, uh, page 13, 1,343 of the transcript, this is trial number two. And in this case, in your role as retained witness, you're not trying to tell the jury what led to the GI infection. Fair answer, that's fair. And then he goes on and says, I'm not qualified to do it. Um, he actually repeats it again. Um, I know there was a lot of discussion, a lot of objection, but ultimately I thought he got the opinion out, but Mr. Kathy maybe can address that on rebuttal. Again, no, Your Honor, the only opinion he got out was that a GI infection can lead to GBS. That was his opinion. Okay. Whether anything that occurred at Lobster Haven, no matter whether it was bad seafood or, you know, whatever type of bacteria or anything, whether that could cause a GI infection, he expressly and repeatedly said no. And again, that was brought up because there was a concern that he might try to say that, and that would have been a new opinion. You know, there was a whole discussion about Binger saying that's a surprise opinion. He never offered that before, either at his depot or at the first trial. And he said, no, 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 he's not going to do that. And he didn't do that. He never did. He said GI infection can cause GBS, never said what could cause the GI infection. Okay. Uh, I think that covers a lot of the the issues that I know the court was looking at. And I, I would like to say one thing. I hope that we don't ever get there, but I'd just be remiss uh, since I have time if I didn't say it. But I know, uh, you know, the, the briefs actually just asked for a reversal to reinstate the verdict. I believe I heard Mr. Kathy today say that it was for a judgment in their favor. And I don't believe that that's ever the outcome if you were inclined to reverse. Uh, there are other issues that are pending in the post-trial motions, you know, manifest way to the evidence on other issues. There were evidentiary issues that were raised. There's a remitted or pending. So there are a lot of issues that it wouldn't skip straight to a judgment. So I just want to make sure that I correct that statement that was made. And I don't believe it was asked for in the briefs, but I, I thought I heard it earlier. Uh, but other than that, uh, unless the court has any questions of me, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Okay, so um, you have five minutes, Mr. Kath. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the, the stipulation in this case was that on December 21st, 2013, defendants served the Martinez's with seafood, which caused them food poisoning. Um, there was another stipulation that the seafood served on December 21st, 2013 by defendant Lobster Haven to plaintiffs, Angel and Maria Martinez had a defect. Um, uh, on, in the transcript at 1439, defense counsel also says, we are not contesting that the oyster, oysters led to the GI infection period. I was specifically avoided in this trial, so we didn't have to, pr to present evidence with the proper uh, handling of the seafood, the proper seafood service of the seafood. Um, so to, to say that the, that was not stipulated to um, is inaccurate. Um, Dr. DiDio. Uh, so let, before you move on, are you, are you saying that the stipulation was to the GI, to, that it goes that far? Well, the uh, food poisoning is a type of gastrointestinal infection. Because Mr. Tinker is drawing a clear distinction between the two, and I and I, are you or are you not? No, we're we're saying they're the same thing. I mean, gastroenteritis, gastrointestinal infection, GI infection. Food so, poisoning. is there testimony to support that? I mean, who testified to that? I mean, with all due respect, you're you're not qualified to make that opinion. So, you're relying on some evidence. Who said that? Well, the, 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 the best statement really was the one I read from defense counsel that, that was stated in the record, which was, uh, he said, we are not contesting that the oysters led to the GI infection. 
that's in addition to the stipulation about food poisoning. So the defense, defense, lo the defense lawyer said that? The defense lawyer said that, yes. We're not where, is, where is that in the record? 1439. Doctor, if I understood Mr. Tinker correctly, with respect to Dr. Didio's testimony, he's saying it isn't enough for Didio, for Dr. Didio to say that the GI and the GVS are connected because he's still missing a piece of the puzzle, which is the food poisoning being connected to the G, to the GI. Yes, I understood that to be his argument as well. But the the, the same thing with, happened with Dr. Didio, Didio as Dr. Freeman. Uh, he was asked to assume the stipulated fact, and then he did give the opinion. So he did connect the dots. Um, he, he testified, he was asked, is it your opinion within a reasonable degree of medical probability that Mr. Martinez's gastrointestinal infection, which began on December 21st, 2013, caused Mr. Martinez's GBS? Answer, yes. Then he was asked, assume it's been admitted the seafood served by Lobster Haven caused the Martinez's food poisoning that began on December 21st, 2013. Would it then be your opinion that the seafood from Lobster Haven was the cause of GBS? Answer, yes. So he connected it directly to the, to the food served by Lobster Haven, which they admitted was defective. And so both Dr. Didio- Dr. And as it pertains to the directed verdict motion, whether, whether or not that testimony is an overreach or not, the testimony was never challenged at trial. Is that right? By, well, by, by motion? Not by motion. There was oh, an objection. It was challenged by objection. It was challenged by objection as newly disclosed. It wasn't challenged as speculative or stacking inferences or anything like that, just that it was newly disclosed. Of course, we pointed out he testified exactly to this the first time around, so the judge let it in. The, um, the, the, importantly, the, you know, the jury wasn't asked in this case to decide you know, what the pathogen was that caused it. They were simply asked to decide whether defective seafood caused the illness. The plaintiff's expert said they didn't need to know the pathogen specifically in order to know that the seafood caused it. The defendant's expert said, no, you have to know, you have to identify specifically with a contemporaneous test, a specific pathogen, and there's got to be published studies on that. That was their argument, and the jury was free to reject that. Um, we, we, the, we gave our, our view of the, uh, of the evidence from our experts, and they gave theirs, and they, they had their, their fair chance to let the jury decide all these things, which really all just go to the weight of the evidence. They don't, they don't go to the uh, whether or not there was enough evidence. They just go to the weight of it. Um, the, um, the third thing, uh, Dr. Freeman um, testified that Vibrio parahemolyticus was the most likely source of this infection, but he didn't say that was the only source of the infection. He said that it could have been norovirus from improper food handling. He said it could have even been Campylobacter jejuni, just like the defendants testified. He said that he found that a bit less likely just because of the incubation period, but there were reported cases of, of Campylobacter jejuni infections within a two to three hour uh, window. And so uh, Dr. Freeman, uh, his, his testimony was that the, the specific pathogen was unnecessary to be able to identify whether this seafood meal was the cause. Um, we're asking- uh, Sorry, you're all but out of time. So if you want to wrap it up, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. The, we're asking that this court do precisely what it did in, in James versus City of Tampa on 2016. Now, Judge Black was a concurring judge in that case. And the court there said that because the plaintiff presented expert testimony to support his claim, the trial court erred in directing the verdict and went on to say that, the, that to be sure that the city in that case was was able to blunt the force and effect of the evidence by cross-examining the plaintiff's experts, presenting countervailing expert testimony, as well as presenting other evidence at trial. And, and as effective as that presentation may have been, it did nothing more than create a question for the jury. And that's the situation we have here. So for that reason, we ask that the, this court reverse the direct verdict. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you both very much. Uh, excellent you. argument. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, concludes our docket. We will adjourn to deliberate.